had the privilege of covering Tony La Russa, uh, as the manager of the Cardinals, and it was uh, never a dull moment. I learned so much, and I've told him that many times through the years. I learned so much. You could have a open discussions with him. You could ask him anything. You, he would explain his moves. Uh, we occasionally would get into it a little bit, but that's okay too because, uh, you know, with Tony La Russa, if you have one of those things, he forgets about it as soon as it's over and you move on. I mean, so I respected the hell out of that as well. But anyway, um, it was one of the highlights of my career to be able to uh, cover Tony La Russa for 16 seasons. He joins us now. It's been too long since we've talked. Tony, I didn't mean to embarrass you with that, uh, with that <laughs> intro. How, how you doing, man? Well, I'm not used to getting your compliments, so I enjoyed it. <laughs> Listen to you. Listen to you. Um, no, um, I got to ask you because I know our listeners want to know, and, and you know all the reports are that your health is good, you're feeling good, you got through a tough time. Is that check out? Is that pretty much where it, th- things are going now? All, all systems go, no, no real, no real problems or worries. No, exactly. That uh, you know, it was a prolonged. It was a health, a couple of health issues and prolonged treatment. But I was in good hands. Here, in, you know, when I was in Arizona at, at Mayo Clinic and. Uh, as of about the middle of the summer, I was uh, diagnosed cancer-free, and when I've gone back to get you know get checked and rescanned and stuff, I'm feeling better every day, and it's all all looking good. You know, a lot of things I wanted to ask you, and I listen. You um, in St. Louis, I mean, you guys, uh, your first year, you get the game seven of the NLCS, you made an in, in, immediate impact. But then there were some challenging times with a couple of losing records in there, and I'm not trying to bring up the negative stuff. It just sets up the question. You know, as you know, the Cardinals are coming off a really uncharacteristic season for them, you know, 71-91. When your teams, whether they be in Chicago or Oakland or St. Louis, when your teams would have a year that just got away from you and it's kind of a downer, how did you – what did that do for you in terms of getting ready for the next season? Like, what, what did you try to do from a leadership standpoint – uh, to get things back on track, because the Cardinals are in that situation now. They want to rebound in 2024. Uh, how are you able to pull that off as often you did, get get your team back on track? I'll start the explanation by quoting uh, one of the Cardinal greats, George Kissel, uh, because one of the reasons he's a great was he had so much great experience and knowledge that he passed along to all of us. And one of the ones that I think I treasured the most because it was something that, you know, just by the way he explained it, it was a daily lesson, was that you, the best learning that you got was not from reports. They were all this stuff was important, the information, all that stuff. But it was a game that was just played. He said, really concentrate on what just happened because you had a plan on how you were going to pitch to them and hit against them. And then once the game is played, you can you can start to evaluate, well, no, we were wrong on, you know, Bernie's a better high ball here and low ball here, whatever it is. <laughs> well, that translated into when the season is over, what do you do then? You have 162 games maybe, you know, if it's a rough year, that's what you had. You didn't have any more in the playoffs. And you had the, the ability to learn what, you know, what went wrong. And that was George's very strong message on a daily basis and a yearly message. So if we had a season like uh, like 97, for example, uh, you know, there were things that, that didn't go right for us. And one of the things is uh, mentally it happens too often that the team that wins celebrates well into the next spring camp or, or, or summer camp, and you, and you don't get off to a good start uh, fundamental-wise. So my point is that uh, every time we had a tough year, we had to really know it. 99 was another tough one, and uh, I think Walt and his group of scouts and advisors, they really evaluated that uh, our needs were A, B, C, you know, one, two, three, and then you go to work on, on fixing them. And, uh, you know, Walt was a master of that. If you remember, that was the, the – well, he had just acquired Renteria, but that's the winner. He brought Daryl Kyle in, and, uh, uh, Mike Matheny, and uh, Dave Veers. So – the answer, I, I think, Bernie, is, is George's wisdom. And Carl just have to really be honest about, okay, what went wrong? And sometimes, you know, stuff just doesn't work, and it's easily explained. And sometimes you can look and you can pinpoint and say, wait a minute. You know, we, we, you know, we, we got 
we just did not teach well. We didn't play well, whatever it is. But it, they can learn from last year if they do it properly. Tony LaRusso with us. Uh, one of the things impressed me, too, that you were um... – you had a lot of success, but you uh, you never uh, stopped trying to evolve if you felt that there was something you could do better. And I remember one of those years, I, I forget which one, I remember one of those years, for whatever the reason, and it happens to the best teams and the best managers and coaches, things weren't quite right in the clubhouse. It was just off. It was just one of those years. But rather than you say, oh, well, things will get better, you took, you took leadership on that. I, and I, I, know, remember, I do remember what you did. You formed, like, for lack of a better term, like a leadership council of, of, of players, whether it's four or five guys, whatever. And you brought them in on some of the decisions. Like, if, hey, listen, if we can travel better, I want to hear it. If there's something we can do better, I want to hear it. Don't be afraid to tell me. I really want to know what's up. We, we all got to get on the same page, and everybody needs to – treat each other mutual respect so your your opinion matters to me and that immediately made a huge impact and uh things were really good after that um how do how do you do that though um is it is it harder to do do you think for a manager now whatever city he's in um to with with the money that's being paid to players and the security they have is is it harder to reach players and uh, to make that breakthrough and to get everybody on the some some page on the same page sorry um when maybe the motivation to do something like that's not as strong as it used to be, and maybe I'm wrong about that. What do you think? No, I just think that you have to be aware of how circumstances are changing, whether the, the attitudes of the players or the, you know, the, the benefits or uh, problems that they have. But the basic uh, foundation is the same. If you don't create a really solid foundation of, of a team that it commits. To, you, know, you know, producing the effort on a daily basis to prepare and then compete, and if they don't really take pride on on how they compete, you know, the execution. Where, you know, the famous uh, example that the Cardinals are use, you know, they, we just don't make as many mistakes as other people. You know, it, it, that that's the foundation. And over the years, you know, things change a little bit. No doubt. I remember when I first started managing '79. You know, you just started getting free agency and. Uh, multi-year contracts and you know there's a lot more media around so the distractions of money you know fame and fortune were there now you know lately other things have has gotten into besides that and it, but it's still the same process i just think that you you have to understand in the end you know you, you've got to get back to the basics you know it's a really simple game bernie uh, occupation really the, the whole thing generates around your team at the major league level, and that's why the organization's put together, your team plays against another team a nine inning game, 162 times, with a score. And if you want to play in October, you got to have a bet, the bet, enough of a record, right? I mean, that's really what it's all about. And you got, and you, that's your starting point. And the guys have to embrace the competition. They have to embrace their contribution to it. And sure, they they can be distracted with you know their agents or somebody yelling at them. You got got to get more at bats or more touches or whatever it is. You need more money, but in the end, if you just develop those relationships on a, on a one-to-one basis, I'm talking about player to player, coach to player, manager to, you know, that overcomes everything, and it, that has not changed and will never change. Tony, do you think that, and this isn't really, this has nothing to do with you coming out of retirement and, and managing the White Sox, and you had a special relationship with Jerry Reinsdorf, and it was a, it was a unique circumstance. So maybe it's not the same as some, a lot of the other managing jobs. Is the job tougher today for managers, whether they're younger managers or veteran managers, because of uh, the escalating salaries, the money that's on the line, the, the influence of agents, but also – and I, you and I have talked about it. Also, uh, the fact that there's more, there's more. Uh, how do I put it? Cooks in the kitchen, like with the advanced metrics and the information and front offices. It might be challenging the manager to do some things, even though the manager may not be totally comfortable with it. Is it tougher to manage in today's climate, uh, based on your experience? I think that uh, most of the issues that you face are pretty much the same, you know, with a little difference here or there. The most significant change now is the, the the detriment that organizations create by 
uh, presenting a manager with uh, so much information and a determination that you better follow it or you're not going to keep your job. So, you know, an easy way to explain it is that when you're trying to earn respect as a coach or as a coaching staff or a manager downstairs where the action is, they respect the decision maker. So if the decision maker they understand is coming from upstairs, they write the lineups, they, they discuss the pitching changes, it just strips you of one of the most important things that you've got. Because then you'll be blamed because the team is not hustling or not executing. Well, the, the respect is going upstairs. And I think too often now, organizations, that's why it's an organization-by-organization organization kind of explanation too, too often, the, the organization really believes that those numbers control, I mean, dramatically control what happens in that game-to-game competition, and, and it, that's just not true. It's a very dynamic situation because it's men, not machines. So if you're in an organization that really is looking for uh, a, a, a puppet that's going to take all that information and go out there and play with it, then it makes it really hard to compete makes it really hard to have earn respect and trust, and you will get beat. Now, if you play with an organization that understands that information is really important, and they provide it, but they got to give the, the people that they entrust on a day-to-day basis in uniform the ability to earn the respect and trust of the players. And that, too often, if you just look around at, at situations, that 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 often is not happening. And I mean, look, you know, Boshi just. Uh, won a World Series. You know, Buck Schulter's first year, he came and, and, and they won 100 games. Well, even, you know, your, your friend you're talking to, my first year back in 2021, 20, he won the division with 93 games. Well, in each of those situations, at least in the get-go, they started out the benefit of the doubt, and I think the organization really contributes to that. And, and to follow up on your point, you know, uh, based on my experience, you know, players players can detect – when they think the managers just sort of mm-hmm. following orders and um, maybe has has uh, kind of lost some juice that way, they, they they know what's up. They're not dumb, absolutely. And, you know, and and uh, that that makes the that makes it really really tough. Uh, I want to well, ask you about something. Tough, Bernie. If, if you're being held accountable for it, which right. you are, except that they're they're, they're stripping you of, of of that respect. It's and trust. It's so important down there. I want to go back to your career in St. Louis and one of my observations and, you know, and sometimes I didn't, it's amazing to me that you were able to pull things off because the way you did, because I can't tell you the number of players when I would ask them about Tony La Russa, what's it like to play for him? You know, so on and so forth. I'd hear, man, he, he's tough. Boy, he can be, he stays on you. You know, he doesn't let up. Sometimes, He's a pain in the butt, and you just you get sick of it, and blah blah blah. He said, but then, you know, you respect the hell out of him because you realize after a while, all he's trying to do is make you better, keep you focused. And I remember Jim Edmonds is a great example of this. And I don't know if you remember this when you won the World Series in 2006. I told you something he said in the aftermath of winning the World Series in the interview room, <laughs> and I even actually went and got the printout of it to show you because. You know, Jim was a great, great player, but Jim was, could be a, a handful, and I don't mean that to disparage him. And he was a little higher maintenance, maybe some, some of your other guys. And so it wasn't easy, and you had to push because you just had to push. He didn't like it or whatever, but, but Jim Edmonds almost cried in, at the podium after you won the World Series talking about how you made him a better player, a better competitor. He viewed you almost like a second father. And I remember telling you that in your office, and you were just like, wow. Like, I mean, that really got to you. How did you manage to do that? When, guys, you were a hard-wired competitor. You did push. You did challenge. Um, but with rare exception, your guys understood it, and they respected it, even though sometimes you probably really got on their nerves and they needed a break. But how did you manage to pull that off? Well, um, I mean, that's, that's probably the most important thing that we, you could, we could talk about today. Because that, that was true then, it's true now. Um, you know, you play 162 games. The edge that you're looking for is a team that commits that, com- that commits to competing every day. I'm talking about every day with the e- effort and execution, right? So right. The, th- the, the quality that that I tried to live up to, and if you 
preach it, you better own it, is to be relentless. That meant that every day was the biggest game of your life, seventh game of the World Series. So, so yeah, I had a very relentless kind of attitude, and, and I knew in my heart, and I believe it to this day, that that's the kind of attitude that the team has to adopt. You know, and you can have a hiccup or two. Everybody has sometimes without, you know, getting off, off the point. But the most important point is for the club to really push each and every day. That's the beauty of the 162 games. That's how, that's where your edge is. If you push more than the other teams, you're going to get an edge. And if that pushing means that you're playing better, so yeah, I pushed. But the, at the bottom line, this is this is what my favorite part of of my life since then. But the bottom line is whether it's and this is not just Tony. It was the coaching staff. We always established in our relationship with the players that, yeah, we were there to make you better and to push you, but it was there. We were going to try and earn your respect by the way, because we came out there every day. We were going to earn your trust because we were going to tell you the truth and we believed in you. And if you do that, you create this chemistry. And I guess sorry, that this is what I'm going to end up with two discoveries with two points to this day. Whenever I see any player, and this this was true, Chicago and Oakland. The thing that we talk about the most is is how we all felt as a unit. I just saw John at a lunch at the winter meetings. There was John Jay, Alan Craig, and uh, Dan Descalzo, and I walked into where they were. And, you know, it's all hugs, and you know, and everybody's. And, and the last thing that we said to each other, we broke away. You know, I love you. You know, I love you. So what you do is you create this love. But what's it based on? It's based if you're if you're the leaders, it's based on setting. Uh, 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 an expectation of what it, what it is to be in the uniform, the Cardinal uniform, how you have to live up to it and, you know, pat them when they deserve it, pop them when they, when they need to do it. But you always are showing that you care about them and you're, 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 you're really working to uh, earn the, earn the respect and trust of the player and maintain it. And the only way you can do that, Bernie, is to be honest about how hard you push and and the, and I don't I can't overstate this. You do it with a with a, a very caring hand. They they knew the coaches and the manager. We cared about them personally and professionally. And this is what we had. That was our contribution to that game competition was to help them get mentally and fundamentally ready. And then. The biggest part of the game is that these players playing against each other and entertaining fans. We only got a few minutes left, so I wanted to ask you about this. Because you mentioned Skip Schumacher, you mentioned Descalso, you mentioned John Jay, and there are others, mm-hmm. uh, Joe McEwing. Um, so many of your players have gone into coaching or even front office jobs, or in Skip's case, managing. And they're, they're doing really, really well. And it seems like around baseball, people have caught on the fact that these are good guys to bring your organization. What does that mean to you to see your former players uh, sort of uh, continue, you know, continue on a different track, player to manager or coach, and, and do really well? Well, we, we get fired up about that, and I and I, fight, I say that we, Bernie, because it was a product of the coaching staff, and uh, and I was part of it, you know, and in, in, in what you try to develop as far as the edit, attitudes of professionalism. So we love it. When these guys stay in the game, and and all we were trying to do was what we were taught to do. I mean, there isn't anything that I said or did as a manager that, that didn't come from somebody else. So, you know, I love the fact that these guys are, are you know, are are, are, are after it, and, and uh, what you try to do when you have your chances to make sure that you you instill some you know professional and personal attributes that, that are going to help them. Tony, I wanted to ask you one more thing, and uh, boy, I, we could—not uh, that I would, you know, want to uh, take up too much of your time or wear you out, but I, I, I could talk uh, talk for hours with you. It just kind of reminds me of the old days a little bit, and I, I just love it. But anyway, I wanted to ask you about this earlier in the show. I was talking about Walt Jockety because I was doing research for something I'm going to write, you know, about the impact different people have had on the, the you know, the Cardinals in the 28 years of Bill DeWitt's uh, owned the team, and. Listen, man, I covered all this stuff, but until you sit down and you relive it and you write down names and you say, oh, this trade, that move, that that guy he drafted, um, and his staff and his scouts, not just him alone, uh, but but all the, the high-impact moves he made, 
in, in that sort of that peak time from 90, uh, 96 through 2006, um, it's just profound what, what he was able to do for the Cardinals and, and the opportunistic trades and not giving up much and, and really smart free agent signings. And, you know, you, you win the World Series in 2006 for a lot of reasons, but your pitchers were Carpenter, your, your lead starting pitchers were Carpenter and Supon and Weaver. And, you know, Walt took a chance on all those guys. They weren't exactly, you know, Carpenter's coming off a bad shoulder thing in Toronto. He had to sit out a year. None of those guys, would, I would say, would like, like had high st- – they, they, there was a big stock price on them. They were kind of like at a lower ebb. And then the guy, the, the, the rookie closer, someone, Wainwright, the guy he traded for. I mean, on and on and on. That World Series team in 2006. And, again, I, Walt, I'm not saying Walt did this alone, and I know he valued your input, and you guys worked together as a team. But it's amazing what Walt Jockety did here, and you look back on it, it, it becomes even more impressive. And I, and, I think, um, and I think Bill DeWitt knows this, and I think that they're okay now on a personal level. It wasn't a, it was not a, it was not a warm uh, parting. But but Walt needs to be in the Cardinals Hall of Fame. I mean, I feel so strongly about that. It's unbelievable the impact he made in his organization. It started with uh, with Bill too, but convincing you to come to St. Louis and take the managing job. But I'm sorry, I went on and on and on. If you could just take it from there, you know, the impact yeah. that Walt had and your thoughts about him being a Red Jacket guy. Well, I hope I don't you don't lose because it's having my phone every once in a while the volume kicks out on me. That's you okay. Can't, you can't encourage uh, the attention to Walt enough based on what he deserves. I mean, I, I really think he's been kind of a forgotten guy there because he's not one that draws a lot of attention to himself. But what he did during his tenure with us is incredible. And you can have all kind of examples. You mentioned a bunch of them. But, you know, you look at the, the, the deadline deals during the season. Look at every, every year he brought in some – horse whether it was will clark or scott Rowland or, or uh, larry walker or, or uh, will clark i mean um chuck finley i mean and, and the guys that he gave up there's only a couple guys really came back to, to honor but what, what walt established was among the the other general managers was a respect and trust they trusted him because you know he he, he wanted to be, he wanted he, he would tell you the truth about what he was offering and what he would take it wasn't any games later on. You come back, you say, oh, man, that son of a gun was out there to get me. <clears throat> so um, his tenure was unfortunate because it really it, it works really to amplify the legend of, of Walt Jockety because there was a guy that came into the organization that tried to, you know, jump jump ahead of guys ahead of him, stab, actually literally stab him in the back, and Walt fought, fought it. And at the time, you know, I'm hopeful that at this point Bill understands that, you know, that, it, what would happen, but uh, Walt lost his job because of, of Blue Now, and, and 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 Walt figured that guy out in a, long, a long time ago. So uh, he deserves. I'll be all. I'm all for you know, him being a Hall of Famer, but it's just the way he did it. And the other thing that I would mention is that Walt, when he evaluated talent, he also evaluated the attitude, what the guys, you know, what he would bring to the ball club. So it wasn't just, uh, you know, numbers or, 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 or per past production. It's the fit into our family chemistry. Um, amazing job. He did an incredible job of, of what he did in our years. And, by the way, when he left us, you know, he beat us with Cincinnati two or three times. So <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, and he still remained. And, by the way, to our fans that are listening to this, uh, you know, I went through my health. Help Walt's going through his health thing right now where – He's our number one priority. All of us that uh, know him and love him, uh, you know, he's he's gone through a procedure and he's going to be okay. But uh, it's it's a, you know he's having to work hard to get back to 100. percent So make make sure everybody thinks about him. I didn't know that. Thanks for sharing that with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, text him and check in check in on him. I'm gonna be writing something about him too. I'll make sure he sees it. I'll I'll, I'll send you a link to that too, so you can read it. I'll, I'll get to that uh, soon. Can you I, know, I'll tell you one more. Can I tell you one more thing, Bernie? Sure, please. Okay, so you know Walt. Comes, you know, Walt is a, a very good person. He's a very nice guy, uh, quality family man. And, you know, represents the organization great. Uh, and to some people, 
uh, he told me, well, maybe, you know, he, maybe he's not tough enough at times. And I, I, I've told this story a bunch of times and people enjoy it. You know, we knew each other back from when uh, we were with the White Sox organization, AAA, and then with the A's. Known each other a long time. Well, I always saw the tough side of Walt when it came down to the professional side. So every once in a while I would tell him, it didn't happen too often, I would tell him, you know, I'm just not sure your, your, your scouts are giving you enough information. And he'd turn around and look at me and says, i tell you what, you just take care of what's going on downstairs. Don't get on my scouts. I say, and he did that with other coaches listening. And we go, oh, wow, yes, sir, Walt. So, you know, he's, he was, he's a beautiful man, but he was also tough enough to be really outstanding. Well, I've, I've told that, and I, I got it going for it, but I've told people that on the air. In fact, I mentioned it today. The thing about it made it really special in St. Louis uh, when you and Jockety were working together. And you and, you and Mo got along great, too. I'm, I, I don't want this being misinterpreted. But I say, you know, the, they, it, the dynamic there was, was so strong because Tony would push. Tony would say, I think we need this. We need that. I think we should maybe go get this guy or whatever, whatever it may be. And Walt would, felt differently, and you would hash it out. You'd probably argue a little bit. And you'd push again, and he'd still say, no, Tony, I don't think that's the way we're going to go. And the thing about you is you told me this so many times. Like, look, you know, good organization. You have people that can disagree and even, you know, debate it, argue the point. It's okay to push back and forth. But once this final decision is made, that's it. You move on. you gotta, you got to move forward. That's right. And, and uh, that was one of the great things about that, with the way that organization operated. You know, it really was. Because you and well, Walt think, could say you, you and Walt could say anything to each other. You could get mad. It didn't matter. Once a decision was made, everybody moved on. Because you're all about the same thing, trying to win. Well, we always understood each of us had a job, right? The front office, you know, they look at they look at the big picture, and they and they put guys in uniform. And it's nice when you have a chance to be respected and heard from, asking opinion. But in the end, they get that final decision. Then it's up to us to get the uh, the game, the competition, and the wins out of it. But in the end, uh, the most important attitude you can have, and you, and you, you see it another way. This isn't, wasn't us. This has been taught before to other people. You play with what you got, you know, especially when you know upstairs are doing the best you can. If you disagree about it, you wish you had this guy, that guy, whatever it is, once, once you communicate it and it's over, then you just play with what you have. And it's a very healthy attitude to adopt. Tony, uh, this was wonderful. Happy New Year to you and your family and all your loved ones, and I, I appreciate your time. Always great to talk to you. Try to do it more often without being a pest, but uh, uh, re- I'm very, very, very happy that everything's going well with your health, and you sound great, and uh, look forward to seeing you around Bush Stadium again soon. Thank you, my friend. Well, thank you very much. appreciate that. See you, man. That's our friend Tony LaRusso, and I know we're out of time, but, man, what a great conversation. Jim Hewer, I know we got to go. Take your time. It was great. I, yeah, I mean, but I, I I can't just say goodbye. I mean, <laughs> see, that's kind of stuff I used to do. I, I could do. I had the chance to do for 16 years. Just I'd go in his office. We'd sit there. He's trying to unwind from games. He's not ready to go. You know, have his wine or whatever. And he's you know he's going over reports and all this stuff. And and uh, he would uh, we would talk about so many things that had to do with baseball try to get into his mind about this and that. How do you do this? How do you do that? What about this uncomfortable situation? How do you deal with the front office? How do you deal with Bill when you're trying to get, I mean, just a million things. Why'd you do that in the game? Because most people don't understand it. So you explain it. I want to hear why you did it. And I learned that there's usually a lot of managers usually have a really good reason. It reasons plural to make a strategical move, even if it doesn't work, that their thinking behind it was solid. And I never, I never forgot that. I, I, to this day, I retain that very much because it's true. We'd have these deep conversations. We'd get into a lot of things as far as just um, he'd share some stuff. Never, never tell secrets on people, though. Never backstab anybody. But he was very, very forthcoming, and we would have some really, um, really deep conversations about a lot of things, and I always treasured that. And like I said, every now and then we'd get into it, and nowadays I look back on that, and they're really funny. I mean, I'm kind of glad it happened in a way because those those things are also precious memories. <laughs> uh, but man, just 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 that half hour or so, uh, the stuff that um, the stuff that he said about leadership, about Walt Jockety, about um, 
his former players now going, sort of following in his footsteps, although he'll never say it that way. Just, just all the things we got deep on there. That was awesome, man. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. I'm with you. So, yeah. Anyway, with that, I will say goodnight. I know we're late getting off the air, but sometimes it's a special reason. 